Hi guys, welcome back to my show. Before we get started, I'd like to thank everyone who gave me great feedback, uh, encouraging, kind words from my first podcast episode. I thank you all because it just makes me feel really happy that the content that I'm putting out there, uh, you are enjoying it. So guys, let's get started with today's episode. One of the questions that I got from a student at my academy was, why are there so many Wing Chun interpretations? If you've watched or heard my first podcast episode, I mentioned what Applied Wing Chun was and uh, basically saying that it was my Sifu's interpretation of what he learned from the late Grandmaster Yip Man. So this student of mine, Karen, she asked me, why are there so many Wing Chun interpretations? And what I can say to this is basically even just at school when the English teacher gives out a book for everyone to read and then basically write an essay or an assignment regarding that book, you'll find that if there are 25 students in the classroom, not everyone will have the same thing to say about that given book. The same thing applies to martial arts training. If we, you know... Take into consideration, when the Tsifu is teaching a group of people, just say the same technique, not everyone will absorb that piece of knowledge the same way. Now, why? Because, number one, how skillful is the student? How long has that student been training? See, as a Sifu myself, I can see when I'm teaching a class, let's say with 20, 25 students, and I'm teaching a particular technique or sequence, not everyone will absorb that piece of knowledge the same way. Because in a classroom with X amount of students, you'll find that students have different skills, right? Um, different levels of experience. So all this plays a part with how you interpret what you are learning. Now, some teachers have the, the drive and the passion to really get the most out of every student in the class. So, you know, when students ask questions, the, the teacher is always there ready to answer. Other students um, may not ask that many questions or other teachers may not uh, encourage students to ask questions. So all these factors play an important role with how a person will interpret what they're learning. Now, if you take into consideration, back in the day when a Kung Fu master would teach his students, there wasn't a systematic approach to teaching the art form, all right? So you have to understand that there wasn't like a set curriculum, syllabus, where student comes in and starts from point A and then they move them to B and C and so on and then there's a time frame. So all these things didn't really exist when the late Grandmaster was teaching Wing Chun. And um, also, as we all know, there were no certifications given to the students. Okay, and that's really important because anyone can claim from that era if they you know, learn from Yip Man. Anyone can say, ah, oh, I learned from Yip Man. I learned from the Grand Master. And then kind of like automatically people would give them the position of Grand Master, okay, which is a term that nowadays it seems like everyone is overusing. And that's a topic for another episode. So how long did a particular student learn and train under Yip Man? Okay. Were there any certifications given to them? No. So we all know that. So if a student learned, let's say, nine months, someone else learned two years, maybe someone else learned five years, these three students will learn completely uh, different things according to the time frame of their training and also how much effort did you really put into your training? Also, uh, an important uh, point to, to kind of think of is 
the space of the school where they were training. How many p participants were there in every lesson and the age of the students, okay? We know that many of them were restaurant workers and uh, from uh, the bus union and this and that. And at the time, you know, Hong Kong was in a space of time where there were, it, it was very tough. There were lots and lots of Chinese immigrants coming from the war to Hong Kong. So uh, life was pretty tough and people that were working, they were working long, long hours and you just had to do it because you knew that if you didn't, there was someone else waiting to get your job. So all these factors, you put them into consideration. You're working, you know, 12, 14 hours uh, at your job. You're maybe late 20s or mid 30s. You're coming into a school where it's jam-packed, not much space to train. Um, you're tired all day, you know, working on your feet. You're going to come and train martial arts. Sure, okay, but what type of training are you going to do? Uh, let's do some chisao. Let's, uh, you know, drink some tea, uh, play mahjong. So all these, all these factors, in my opinion, play a very important role. Um, because if you're exposed to a certain part of the Wing Chun curriculum and the Wing Chun system, that's basically all you will know from your experience in training. Now, also take into consideration that uh, several of the senior students were opening schools just around the corner from Yip Man, okay? And they were direct competition from their Sifu. So who's going to take care of their bowl of rice? <laughs> okay, so that's also something that, you, that we all have to think about. Now, in terms of learning... So in this graph, let's say we've got Yip Man at the top and then we've got a couple students. And of course, we all know that he had more than a couple. So this is just, uh, uh, if you're listening to this episode on iTunes, you may want to check out this uh, on YouTube. So we have to multiply this by, you know, five, ten, but just for the sake of this demonstration, let's say... Student A on the left, he learns 70% from the teacher. Student on the right, let's say he learns 40%. So the student that learned 70%, that became his 100%. That's all he knows. Same with the other student who learned 40%. That's everything he knows. That becomes his 100. Now, these students have each three students. How long and how much will these students learn from their teacher if their teacher's 100% is only really 70%? So that's how this starts to degrade, unfortunately. So then you put this down to two, three, four generations, then, then the Wing Chun system becomes so far off from what it's meant to be that you might as well give it another name. And that's how, you know, this works. That's how... You find today so many different interpretations of Wing Chun. So you may ask yourself, well, how can we maintain uh, the proper form of Wing Chun? Well, number one, you always have to refer back to the theory and the principles. Are you following the theory when you are executing your technique? Okay, where can you find these techniques? In our forms. All right, so we all know that our forms act almost like our own alphabet. So are you referring back to them? You know, so these are all questions that one has to ask themselves just to see where we're at with uh, our own practice. So guys, I want to use this plate analogy and uh, just to give you a bit of an idea and you'll see in a moment where I'm going with this. So what's the main purpose of a plate? So the main purpose is obviously to help you eat. But then, let's say I'm an artist and I say, hang on, I see plate as art. I want to, you know, paint some pictures on it and it's all about decoration. So can we say that 
a plate was not meant for it to be a decorative item? No, we can't say that because someone else out there is maybe getting paid millions of dollars with their Ming uh, plate that they've got on display. Someone else may say, hang on, my plates, I use them for juggling. I work at a circus, so that's how I use my plates. Now, if we translate this to Wing Chun, so what's the main purpose of Wing Chun? Okay, in my opinion, it's learn to fight. It's self-defense. That's what Wing Chun was made for. And many of you out there will agree that that's the main purpose of Wing Chun. But someone else out there will say, not really, because Wing Chun, the main purpose is for health. That's how they practice the system, with that in mind. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Someone else out there will say, I use my Wing Chun for performance because I want to get into the film industry or whatever it is. Now, in my experience, if you train Wing Chun with the main purpose in mind, which is for self-defense, for learning how to fight, will you get the benefits of health and can you perform this at a demonstration, tournament, or on films? Absolutely. I've done all three of them. So, but where do I have a problem with this is when someone learns, trains, and spends all their time focused on just the health benefits of practicing Wing Chun, and they really have no clue on how to use it in a practical way, how to apply the Wing Chun system for them to defend themselves, but they still sell it as an effective form of martial art. That's where I have a problem. That's where I draw the line. Because not only am I a Sifu, but I'm also a dad. I've got two boys. I've got a teenager, a 13-year-old son, and I've got a 10-year-old son. And I have, at my school, I have many parents that come to us with, you know, looking for a program where their child can learn self-defense or even a young adult or someone who is already in the workforce and they encounter, let's say, a, a, a bully or they have to take public transportation and they've had a nasty experience. So they really want to learn how to defend themselves, how to fight if they need to and boost their confidence. So I take this very, very seriously. So with that in mind, that's how I teach. Everything that I teach is based on how can I help how can I help this person develop their skills? How can I help that person be effective if they need to protect themselves? That's what I'm all about. Will they also get the benefit of, you know, getting healthier, fit and stronger? Absolutely. But someone who has focused their entire call it career just developing, you know, some form of health benefit because of, you know, the position of the spine and the hands and this and that. And really, you don't know how to stop someone coming at you full force, full strength. Then you shouldn't be selling your interpretation of Wing Chun as an effective form of martial arts. Because in my opinion, it's not. You're putting your students at risk and you're giving, mm, you know, Wing Chun who are searching for an effective martial arts, kind of like a bad name. And that's why, unfortunately, nowadays, we see so many Wing Chun practitioners out there getting knocked out in a few seconds because they really haven't been exposed to the proper form of training, in my opinion. Now, should Wing Chun evolve? That was kind of like another question that I got from my previous episode. I asked my Sifu this, and the answer that I got from him is, of course, it has to evolve. And I agree. I mean, the way people fought 50, 60 years ago is not the same way people are fighting today. Um, what even the Yip Man students back in the day in the 50s, what were they exposed to when they were practicing? Okay, so when they would do the, the, the famous challenge matches on the rooftops, 
Who were they fighting? Chances are nine out of ten times they were fighting kung fu practitioners. Okay? Uh, nothing wrong with that. How big and strong were their opponents? My guess is pretty much the same as they were. Okay? Now, you bring these uh, individuals and expose them to other forms of martial arts. You expose them to other body types. Then, in no time, you'll see that their Wing Chun starts to evolve because the techniques they're dealing with are different from what they were used to back in Hong Kong. Okay, and you can see that from some of the Wing Chun students, uh, Yip Man students, who went overseas, right? You, you can see that there, there is an adaptation and you can also see the ones that did not and then they, they just stayed in Hong Kong. You can see this style of Wing Chun kind of uh, differ from the ones that went overseas. Now, should Wing Chun change? In my opinion, no. Can it change? Of course it can change. But then just call it something else. All right? Now, where do you, do you find the difference between evolving and changing is basically, to me, you change it when you are no longer following its theory and principles. Okay? That's when you're changing it and that's where you're getting far off from the, the core essence of Wing Chun. So just like they say, if you have two ships and they take off and one ship is off by one degree, by lunchtime, by the evening, they can't see themselves because one has drifted out and then in a matter of a few hours, they're so far off that they can't see each other. Same thing happens with Wing Chun. Now, let me give you this analogy or example. We all know that the English language has 26 letters, okay? And my background is from South America, from Chile. My parents are Chilean. And uh, in the Spanish alphabet, there's just one extra letter, which is ñ. So just one letter difference between the English alphabet and the Spanish alphabet, and guess what? It's an entire different language. So if you think of your Wing Chun and you say, eh, you know what? I'm going to add this, or I'm going to move that, or I'm going to just, you know, train a little bit of this and add that concept to, and then that's where it starts to change, in my opinion. That's not evolving. Once again, nothing wrong with that. You can do whatever you like. If you feel it works for you, great, but just call it something else. Don't call it Wing Chun. Okay, guys, so as usual, I don't want to go on for too long. And for the next episode, we're going to be talking about weightlifting. Okay, so I've get, uh, I, I got a question if weightlifting is good or bad. I know there are some people out there that have a strong opinion of this and I have my own. So I'll be discussing that in our next episode and also sparring. Should we go hard or light? And how should we approach our sparring uh, techniques? Okay. And guys, don't forget to check out my online university, umauniversity.com.au. And if you haven't, you can go towards it. And I've got an awesome free introductory applied Wing Chun course, which is this one here. And if you have not been kind of exposed to applied Wing Chun, you can check it out. There are many, many different videos that I've posted there and it will help you get a good foundation with your training and um, it's absolutely free. So that's it guys for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to, you know, give me some feedback. What do you think? Do you agree with me or not? Do you have any questions regarding what I've spoken today or any questions for future episodes? And uh, yeah, that's it. Guys, thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Music